Welcome back to the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame YouTube channel. My name is Ed Holinsky. Got another great guest here today, a member of seven different halls of fame, well-renowned Western New York football coach and wrestling coach. Please welcome the one and only coach, Joe Shiplett. Coach, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for joining me today. How's things in your, your world? Oh, they're great, Ed. Everything's fine. The All big, right. this, The big thing is just stay healthy. I got now four kids and nine grandchildren, and the best thing about they're all healthy. I want to talk about your different your career because it's rather interesting to say the least. Um, you grew up in Western Pennsylvania, a Williamsport. Talk about your uh, your youth and growing up and and uh, participation in sports back then. Well, I started in uh, we, then you called it junior high school. Well, we started playing football and uh, my brother and I, he was a year older than me. We would play just, just to tell you how we had to do it. We lived uh, eight miles out away from the school. There was no bus to take you home after practice. So after football practice, my brother and I used to walk a mile and a half to the main road and hitchhike eight miles to get home from football practice. So we did. Then in uh, going into high school, and eventually my dad was able to pick us up after practice so we didn't have to hitchhike home. And I also wrestled in high school. So you grew and up then, with, go ahead. I'm sorry, Joe. Yeah, we have we have we had a great football program in Williamsport. We used to win every year. And the big thing in Pennsylvania, like we'd win the championship, they closed the school on Monday and have a parade. That's how big football was down in Pennsylvania. Question for you. You grew up in Williamsport. You probably could have had a chance to go to a school in Pennsylvania, maybe Penn State, maybe Pitt, maybe West Virginia. How did you end up at UB? Well, they got a football scholarship, of course, so that's why I ended up at UB. And I, you know, I kind of liked it. So, you know, it's a great program. And uh, I still remember the first day of practice at UB. The varsity had been there practicing for two, two weeks for double sessions. Then we were, we were a freshman group that were on scholarship, about 45 of us, I think. So they, we put our, we got there and we put our uniforms on, but out there and they said, well, you're just gonna stretch out, loosen up today and that's it. And after we're done stretching out, the whistle blew and the head coach said, bring them over. And so now we're scrimmaging the varsity. We're a freshman and you couldn't play varsity then. So we were scrimmaging the varsity. They would run two teams at us. We were always on defense. So I remember one play, I got kicked in the mouth and I got stitches. I cut my lips. So they took me in the training room and the trainer says, here, hold these two rolls of tape. I said, what am I holding these right? He said, squeeze them because I'm going to sew you up. I said, what was the doctor rather? I said, well, sew me up. Am I getting Novocaine? No. So they sewed me up. And they said, are you on scholarship? I said, yeah. So we then get back out there. That's what practice was like. And I played. And we had to play both ways. You had to play offense, defense, all special teams. Because if you went out, you couldn't go back into the next quarter. So that's how football was when I was playing high school, college football. Two questions for you back regarding college football. How was the equipment? What was the equipment like? And what was the demands on being a, uh, a scholarship football player at UB? Well, equipment was, we had good equipment. I wore every pad you had, rib pads, arm pads, face masks, everything they made, I wore. And it demands for, well, you had to do your, you know, you had to be eligible. You know, there was no different there. You had to be eligible to play. And, uh, you know, it, it was not, uh, like we didn't have nothing in the summer. In the summer, you they didn't have no program for us for football in the summer. You usually got a job or whatever you wanted to do. After college, uh, you were very fortunate. You began coaching high school football, 1964. Rather young age at that point. You were probably three years out of high school. Um, how did that well, job? How did that job come about for you? Well, actually. As soon as I graduated from uh, UB, I was a graduate assistant at uh, UB and coached football with the freshman team. So I was a graduate assistant for two years, and then I got a job at Sweet Home teaching. And then I was an assistant coach at Sweet Home for one year. Then the following year, I took over the head football job. 
back then, did you think to yourself, wow, I'm now a high, I'm a, I'm a high school head coach at the age of roughly 25 years old. And what the, did you really know what you were doing back then at that point? Well, I thought he did. <laughs> I think every head coach thinks you what they're doing, but you learn, you learn every year. I went to football clinics for probably 25 years straight when I was coaching football. So I, I learned a lot, a lot from doing clinics and being in clinics and football. I think you can learn every day. You can learn a little bit every day, no matter what year you're in coaching. You're credited by, uh, for bringing in the beer offense into Western New York. Um, what intrigued you about the beer offense and to implement it at, at Sweet Home High School? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's very hard to defend. If you only see that beer once a year, once a game, you got a problem. You can't get ready for the beer option in five, six days. It's impossible if you know how to run it. And we learned it pretty good. And so we ran a pretty good beer option. In fact, I noticed there was uh, my son's a head coach in, uh, down in uh, Winter Park, Florida, and he just ran against the team that ran the beer option, and they just lost because they only had about five days to get ready for it because you never see it. It's a hard, it's a hard offense to defend and you have to know what your assignments are. And if you keep changing formations and running the same thing, then you have to adjust. So, well, that's why we ran it and we had a lot of success with it. By the same, to by the same token, how difficult was it to teach the beer offense? No, nah, it's not hard. No, you just have to, we got to work extra with it. We used to work with it in the summer. So, you know, it's, we always work with the kids in the summer. So it's really wasn't that hard to learn the beer option. And, uh, you know, if you notice that Army and Navy and those Air Force, they always run the beer option. They're all the options. If you look at Army, Navy and Air Force, I think two of them still run the beer option, which is, it's, uh, you don't need that. Uh, real big linemen that have to run the beer option. You just got to have guys that are quick and you need a good quick fullback and so forth. And a quarterback that's knows what he's doing. You coached at uh, sweet home for 22 years. What do you recall about those, those days? Are there, are there some memories that stick out more than others for you? Well, uh, I guess the memories are some of the kids you coach with and the, and it was actually, I was the head coach there for 21 years. And, uh, you know, and the winning championships and, and I still see some of the kids that I coach, you know, I still contact with some of the kids. So it's, this was great to just to see a lot of the kids that you coached 21 years ago in the high school. But, uh, then I went on to Tana Wander from there when actually I didn't go, uh, actually when I was a head coach of Sweet Home for 21 years. Then I went to university of Buffalo while I was still teaching at Sweet Home. And I coached there for four years. And then I went to Buffalo State for four years coaching. And then I retired and I went to Tonawanda after that. Why did you get back into high school coaching after you've had such a good career at one school and, and uh, then, you know, going over to Tonawanda? Well, I uh, actually, I was the athletic director at Sweet Home the last six years. So then at, once I retired, you know, I didn't uh, decided that, you know, they were looking for a head coach. And I figured I'll go back to high school and try something, try a different school. And it was, uh, I remember one thing in town, all the years over the town of Wanda, there's one thing that really stands out to me. The first year I was there, we won the, we won the first ball game. We lost the first ball game. We won the second ball game. When the game was over, one of the kids on my team, it was a senior. He came up to me and he was crying. I said, what are you crying for? We won the game. He says, coach, you don't understand. I played modified JV and varsity here and never won a football game. I go, I can't believe that, that you played up six, seven years, six years and never won a game. And that stands out to me ever since I coached anywhere. That was amazing to hear a kid say that. So, so we got lucky at Tonawanda and we had a lot of success there. At Tonawanda, you got a, a much more of a, a bigger taste at playing North Tonawanda. You played some right. games against against North Tonawanda when you were head coach at Sweet Home, but uh, what was what was it like coaching against uh, and playing against North Tonawanda back then? Well, 
you didn't realize unless you coached there that that was one of the biggest games of the year for the people and the faculty and the community. I go, man, I couldn't believe it. The first year we played them, we did terrible. And then the second year when we were, we played them and uh, went into overtime and uh, they had the ball first and they didn't score. They tried to fake a field goal, but they didn't score. Then we got the ball. We went down and we had a good kicker and we kicked the field goal and won the game. So that was the first time we beat Tana. Uh, I guess it's the first time they beat North Tonawanda in many years. So we played them six times and they won three and we won three. Did you and then when I started coaching there, the second, the third year I was there, for some reason, well, I know why we moved. They moved us up on a different division. And I thought, how could you move up? We have them money kids. Well, they made a mistake. They counted the special kids twice. So we went up the division where we got to go to Pioneer and all those other schools. We turn around and won every game, and won every game in that league. Then we had to play Sweet Home in the playoff game, and we lost to them six to nothing, and and uh, that's what happened. But then the following year they put us back down to the division we were supposed to be in. So we had a, so we would battle against Albion every year. So we first two years we won the league, went on to the stadium, and the last year I was there we lost to Albion. And we got in the playoffs, and of course, every year we played. Every year we played in the playoffs. The two times at the stadium was against Lackawanna, who had great teams. I mean, they were amazing. Then the third year, the last year I was there, since Albion won the league, we ended up playing Lackawanna in the playoff game and lost. So it's kind of crazy. But they were Lackawanna had some great talent too. But they were just. Uh, a little better than us at the time, but they were good games. After Tonawanda, you then moved on to Niagara Falls. Right. And uh, what was your experience like uh, coaching Niagara Falls? Well, it was different than, than, than Tonawanda, I can tell you that. I remember when I first got the job, in the summer I would have all my running backs and quarterbacks, and we'd work on the offense we're putting in. Okay, I had six. I had thought I had six pretty good running backs. Come up the first day of practice, none of them were eligible. So I had to get a different kid to play running back. So there was the biggest thing was keeping kids eligible in, in uh, Niagara Falls. That's what I thought it was. So, but I stayed there and uh, was an assistant athletic director too for six years. So, but it's they are the great athletes, but just got to get them eligible was the hardest part. I thought. We went to the playoffs one year, then, I don't know, we just, that was a tough league, and we just didn't, couldn't get enough. You win with linemen. You win games in football with offense and defense and linemen. Never mind who else is. If you don't have linemen, you're not going to do anything. I don't care who your quarterback is or your running backs. You don't have an offense. The problem with the Bills right now, I think, is their offensive line is horrible. I just, I just can't believe. I watch the game, and I just can't believe what they do. They just, they can't run by so at Niagara Falls, it, it didn't, it, the ending for you there wasn't, from what I read, wasn't um, uh, very acrimonious at that point. I mean, they, they, apparently your position was cut in the school district and that meant that you couldn't coach any longer. Right. Um, right. You had to work in the district, the coach, and they, they eliminated assistant athletic directors. Yeah. So and, I couldn't coach there. Tell me, tell us, uh, what happened after Tonawanda? You went to eventually to Williamsville East, but what was the timeline timeline like at that point? And how long did you coach at Williamsville East? I was there. I went there as a JV coach. I was a JV coach, and then the, the head coach, who coached who I coached when he was at Sweet Home, uh, got out, and they I got the head football job there, and I took that for two years, but. Uh, the same thing there. It's just trying to get the kids to come to practice. And uh, Waynesville East is a soccer school. You know, soccer's big there. And football was a little different. But, uh, you know, I've stayed there for two years. And a couple of things happened that really upset me that I just said, I can't come back here. Some, some the kids did something on the football team. And they were my good kids, the good athletes. And the, one was a captain. They did some things that I just said, yeah, I can't coach here 
you know, I don't want to tell you what it is, but it was it's pretty just something they did. So it was kind of disgusting. So I just said, I can't coach it. How difficult was it for you to hang up the whistle? Well, it is really hard. I, then I went to St. Joe's, you know, for two years, assistant coach. I was there and we did pretty good. And then and, uh, then I went back to Tonawanda for one other one year, you know, as assistant. And I put in the offense. It was a young team when we were we were doing all right. We won soon. We assist, but then uh, the new coach came in. I didn't want to be the head coach again. And a new coach came in and he changed the whole offense that I had put in and he wanted me to run the new one. And I said, no, I says, I just put in a new offense and the kids are young and they know it. So he says, well, I want to change it. I said, okay, well then I'm not going to coach here. So I haven't coached since then. Do you miss but coaching? It's only, been, it's only been two years, three at the most. No, I miss coaching. I like to coach, you know. Doesn't matter how old you are. If you're too old to play, fine, but you're not too old to coach. You know, it's you got to know the game. And I find out watching high school games that some of these guys they don't know. See, what the problem is now with high school coaches is some of them don't know how to adjust the formations. There's a lot of offensive putting it in six, seven formations, and on defense you have to adjust to those. If you don't adjust to them, you're in trouble. And I see that all the time. Another thing that gets me is same with the pros. They get on the one yard line and they're in a shotgun and they give it to the quarterback or the quarterback sneak. That doesn't make any sense to me. I said, why, why would you go in the shotgun and you run the quarterback sneak for one yard? I mean, you got the defense line has an advantage or even giving it to the running back. By the time you get the ball and give it to the running back, the defensive line is across the line of scrimmage. So you see it in pros, college and high school. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Every time I see it, I go, Oh my God. Yeah. There's so a lot. There's a lot of people. Now I just follow the. I, mean, I follow the UB and I follow the college. I, mean, I mostly follow the pros, what they're doing, and you know. I but I enjoy coaching. I would probably go back and coach again if the right situation came. How would the athlete change um, from the '60s all the way to the 2000s? I mean, you talked about uh, Williamsville East being a soccer school, but. What have you seen about the, the high school athlete from the 60s till to today? How is it? How has it changed? Bigger and faster. Bigger and faster. When I was coaching football, first year I was coaching football at Sweet Helm, you had to order helmets, you know, and so forth. Most of our helmets were six and a half. Now I think most of the helmets are seven and one eighth for kids. It's amazing the size of kids now and the speed. And I think that's the problem with the pros. They are so freaking big and fast and they're on turf. And when you get a 240 pound fullback hitting a 250 pound linebacker on a turf, something you're going to give. You just can't hold up like that. I mean, they're, what they should do is put grass, put the grass back in and grow it a little bit to slow the kids down. Because that's why they're getting so many injuries. The, the speed is amazing. And the size, they all everybody lifts weights now too. Everybody's big, strong, and I think that's one reason you're getting a lot of uh, problem with the torn ligaments and ACLs. We didn't have that stuff when I played. A ACL tears, you didn't have that. Now you see a lot of ACL tears, and just it's crazy. And the concussions, a lot of concussions are for when your head hits the turf. It's not the getting hit; it's your head hitting the turf, which causes a lot of concussions. And the pros in college or high school because you got playing with turf now. It's like being on concrete. It, it seems that today's high school football that the, the head coaches don't stick around too long for whatever reasons. What's your thoughts on on that situation? I I really can't answer that. I don't know why they wouldn't stick around. I enjoyed being a head football coach, and what's the, what I liked about it is it was my offense and my defense. So this is what I what I believe in and what I did. But uh, I don't know why some of them don't stick around. Most of them do that I know of. I know a lot of them that were there for long years, years. There's some that I think could be family problems that some of them get out. You know, they maybe they get some kids and they need some, my wife needs some help with the kids. You know, that's what happened to my son. My son was a, a head wrestling coach at Hofstra. And uh, they get a, they adopted a little boy. Then his wife had a little girl. They are only about six months apart, so he had to quit coaching because she couldn't deal with it. 
So it could be something like that. Who knows? But, I, but the thing is, I think a lot of the colleges, a lot of, I don't know how many high school coaches go to clinics anymore and learn it. You got to learn the game and you learn something every year. You just, every year you learn more and more. And it's, uh, I'm still learning more and more by just watching things and see what's going on. And I've been to clinics. I used to go to the clinic. I used to go from uh, the Syracuse clinic, the Binghamton clinic. You know, we used to, when I was in, that's what we did. We went to football clinics all the time. And, and then and I got to work football clinics too. So, and Binghamton. So, but every day you can learn something about the game. You never, you never that one day that you can't learn a little bit more. It's always newer things coming up. And I watch the bills and I just shake my head sometimes at what's going on with the football and the pros. You talk about high school uh, wrestling. People forget that you were uh, quite the high school wrestling coach. You, you amassed 232 wins at Sweet Home. Uh, what was it like to coach two sports back then? Football in the fall, wrestling in the winter. Uh, it was, thank God I had a great wife because it was hard. My wife, we had four kids and thank God for her that day because it's hard. It takes a lot of time and uh, you know, and luckily my kids, my three boys wrestled for me too. But uh, we had, a, here's the thing about high school wrestling now. When I was a wrestling coach at Sweet Home, they taught wrestling in elementary school. They taught it in the middle school and they taught it at the high school and physical, physical education classes. I don't think any school in Western New York teaches wrestling anymore. So we really don't know. Some kids probably think wrestling is uh, pro wrestling now, but we used to, we were successful because we ran, we, we, every, we would raise money by running little league wrestling tournaments. And I'd take our kids to a wrestling camp every summer. We did that for like 20, 20, 15, 20 straight years. We go to uh, wrestling camps and uh, that's how you build a program and you get good coaches that work with you and you get kids that are interested, you know, but you don't see that now. You just don't even see what it's in high school. They don't even teach it. Did you, did you encourage uh, several of your football players to come out for the wrestling team or they voluntarily oh, yeah. do it? Yeah, but you got wrestling's a different sport. Some kids can handle it, some can't. I had a kid, I know it was, he was undefeated. And he just told me, he said, Coach, I can't do this because he couldn't stand being on a mat by himself. It's an individual thing. It's a team, but it's individual. So he just quit the right. I said, That's all right. Some people can't deal with that. They has, it's a different type of sport. Like my my kids loved it. I didn't. They loved being on the mat. They didn't care win or lose. They would be out there and wrestle. Some kids can't stand to do that. And so, but I always had good athletes. I got good athletes that sometimes a lot of them wrestled and some of them play football for me. Yeah, I had a lot that did that. I don't know if it's because I coach them in football, but I think that once they got into wrestling, they kind of liked it, and some didn't. I had some that play football that didn't wrestle because they didn't like the sport and they didn't like to be on the mat by themselves. And you got to understand that. But it's a great sport. It's a, I'm going to tell you what, it's a, it's a great, it's a great, great sport. And you really got to be disciplined to be a wrestler. You, that's why I know McDermott for the bills. Cause he was a high school wrestling champion or maybe even college. You got to be disciplined and you got to, and uh, it's just something you got to be in shape for. So it's hard. It was just really a hard sport. I think. Do you think that the, the wrestling skills help them with their football football uh, game and, and vice versa? Uh, say that again. I don't know in what you, what's the question. The question is: Is that being a high school wrestler? Do they take learn some things, some techniques that they apply to high school football and vice versa? Oh, oh sure. Even in the pros, get some of those defensive linemen that were uh, the wrestling that were high heavyweight wrestling championships. Man, they they know. They know a lot of stuff that they use, you know, with their strength and their level and it's different things they do, you know, because sometimes you say, oh, here's this guy. He was a wrestling champion. He said, oh, this kid's going to be pretty tough on defense. And they usually are. Yeah, you see, usually you get at some of those college wrestlers that were heavyweight that wrestled in college and they go to the pros and they play football and they're on the defensive line. You go, yeah, OK, this kid's going to be good. Because they they got the quickness and they got the strength and they know what level is and they know how to they know a lot of things that you know that, that helps being a good football player. Of all your your football teams at the various schools you had over the years, 
What was your most favorite uh, favorite team? What year was your favorite team? Oh, geez, that's kind of hard. I don't know if I really had a favorite team. You know, and there's some good, great kids I had at Sweet Home. And in Tonawanda, I had some some great teams, too, at there. And, uh, and Niagara Falls, I even had a, a couple good kids. You know, you get certain kids. Like, I had James Starks at Niagara Falls. I mean, that kid was... That kid was freaking amazing as an athlete. He, he, I remember in a basketball game, he was the sixth man on the basketball team. He ran down, the other, the, the guy, somebody stole the ball and he's dribbling down to score this other kid. And James Starks is so fast, he ran down and got in front of him and they called a foul on him. After the game, the referee says, I had to call a foul because I didn't think anybody could get down that fast and get in front of somebody because he really didn't foul him. That's how. That's the kind of athlete that kid. That kid was a great kid. He was a good kid too. He wasn't involved in drugs or alcohol. That kid was a great athlete. He just had a tough life there because he was in the projects and stuff. But he was a great athlete. So he could have played. He would have been if he'd have been if he had stayed at wide receiver. If he'd have been a wide receiver, he'd have been playing pros a long time. But you play running back, you you, you usually don't last that long. You take too much pounding. But he's when well, he's the, probably the best athlete I ever coached, I would say. Do you have any regrets about your coaching career, whether wrestling or football? No, not really. Well, yeah, maybe. I like I'm probably sorry I should have stayed at Tonawanda at the time, but what happened there just irritated me so bad. I just said I can't do this, you know. But I don't know. Same with college. I love college coaching too. I love, I was at UB for six years, four years and Buffalo state four years. I was a defensive coordinator at both schools and we had a lot of success. We won a lot of games, but then the reason I got out of college coaching is because I came the athletic director at sweet home and I couldn't coach at college anymore. So for about three, four years, I didn't coach at all while I was athletic director, but no, I, I enjoyed coaching. I go, I enjoyed every team I coached with. I got a lot of kids that I still remember. And, you know, you don't forget those things. A lot of things that happen. And, you know, you just wish you were, you were, you were uh, not starting out again and know what you know now. And it would be amazing, wouldn't it? <laughs> if, if, you but, got uh, a, if you got a phone call today asking if you'd be interested in coming back to high school football and be the offensive coordinator, would you do it? Oh, sure. Sure. I don't want to be a head coach. I like to be a coordinator, either offense or defense. I don't want to deal. I had, I dealt with it. I was a head coach in all those sports and I dealt with the parents and I, you know, a lot of parents think their kids are division one football player and you have to be honest with them. He said, he's not, he's not big enough or good enough to be, but he could play division three or division two, but same thing in a little league. You ever watch some of those parents in a little league? Come on, watching their kid play. It's crazy. I think the problem you got, you got some fathers that were not good athletes and they want their, their kid to be a great athlete. I think that's what you see a lot. But no, I enjoyed every team I've been with and I had a lot of good, a lot of good experiences everywhere that I would never have given up. You know, I don't care if it was college or high school. You belong to seven different halls of fame. What does that mean to you? Well, I think it's a great recognition of what you've done. And uh, I, know I just like my I just got back to my son, Tom, who was a head wrestling coach at Hostra. And he was he my only state champion, by the way, in Sweet Home. He just got into the, the National Wrestling Hall of Fame uh, about a month ago in Syracuse. So that was great watching my son get into that Hall of Fame. And he now he's getting into the Section 6 Hall of Fame in December. And eventually he's going to get into the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame in wrestling, my son Tom. But uh, yeah, it's nice to be recognized in the Hall of Fame. But uh, you know, when you get when you get into the Hall of Fame, you gotta understand that you didn't do it yourself. You had great coaches, you had great athletes. That's why you're there. You can't do it. You can't you can't be the only one to be six. Somebody's gotta be helping you out. I had great, I had great assistant coaches in wrestling too that I, that rest coach with me. So it's, it's the assistant coaches and the talent you got. And if you know the game, you can win. Okay. So, and you gotta have, the thing is 
I think the thing in sports is is the thing that people got to for number of thing is safety. The second thing is discipline. If you don't have discipline with your squad, you're not going to go anywhere. Point number one is score safety, and then discipline, and then you got to know how to teach your techniques. If you don't know how to do that, you don't know how to adjust, and you're not going to win. So you got to know that kind of stuff. And I don't think going on watching some high school, I don't think they do. They just don't know how to adjust the formation. Some teams are pretty good at it. Some teams aren't. Regarding but, your, your coach, regarding your coaching style, coach, would you de- describe yourself as a player's coach? Would you be to describe yourself as a disciplinarian? Um, I was a player's coach. I wasn't, a, I wasn't a real strict disciplinarian, but I had rules. If you don't come to practice, you're not playing. I mean, you, you're not going to skip practice with me. You don't play. And that's for sure. Because I've taken kids' uniforms that skip practice, and I just take their uniform. But that's that's what I said. That's what discipline is. You got If you don't have any discipline, you can't coach. You can't have kids take off practice once a week or they don't want to come. You can't. You can only have a good – it's not fair to the rest of the kids. Not fair to a kid – Let's say he's a starter, but he misses practice all the time and let the other kid practice every day. No, you let the other kid play then. It's just, it's not fair for that. And it's, I just didn't believe in it. If you want, if you like to sport, come to practice. I don't care what team you're on. Everyone's, I was on the 58 team that didn't go to the bowl game, you know, at UB, the Lambert Cup. And we had the two black kids on our teams. And when they told us that we can't go because we couldn't bring the two black kids, I said, are you crazy? When you're in a, when you're in a sport, that's your second family. You would never leave your family behind and go by yourself. So we said, no, we're not going. We don't the hell with you. And we never went to that. We never went to that bowl game. We were supposed to play Florida State in the Liberty Bowl. So we didn't go. And I still believe that was the right thing to do because I could not believe they had a rule like that. But but that's how I feel. You're, you, when you're coaching or you're a, or playing a sport, that's your second family. You treat them like your family and you would not hurt your family. It's like having four kids and say, okay, we don't have the money to take all four of you. Two of you stay home. We're going on vacation. <laughs> that's, what's, that's what they want us to do when they don't want us to come down to the bowl game without our two, two kids on our team. So that's, but number one is discipline and then teach technique. Then know how to adjust the stuff. So that's what I think you got to be able to do. And of course, number one is safety to me. You got to have the right equipment and you got to know, make sure they put the right. Some kids, you know, if you don't watch them, they'll put on a pair of shoulder pads that are too small or they'll get a helmet that's not fit and you got to check them. It's safety. And, and they don't teach using your head anymore to tap. I never taught teaching your head to tap or block, but that's so that's all safety, and then discipline, and then teaching technique. Stuff like that. Well, I enjoy coaching. I still would like to coach. In fact, my wife would like me to get out of the house and go coach. <laughs> I want to go through a couple of North Tonawana coaches with you. And if you could just give me a quick comment about them. Um, George Vetter. Oh, great coach. Don't tell me. Yeah, he was, he was great. I think I played him once. I don't remember when I was at Sweet Home. I better play George. I don't remember, to tell you the truth. Chuck Ramsey. Who? Chuck Ramsey. Oh, no, he's a good, that's a good coach. Yeah, I know I played him. I know I played him. Back there, all, as far as I know, all the, all the coaches that were there when I played against them were good coaches. There wasn't one bad coach. There's no such. There were all the coaches that I played when I was at Tonawanda Sweet Home. They had good coaches. Tana, North Tonawanda was a great football program. You kidding me? Every, every, they were up there every year. They were in the playoffs every year. They're good. I don't know what's going on now with them, but I know over the years they were they were amazing. And you Dave, beat North Carolina, you you beat a good team. Dave and they're always in the one. There was always one or two in their in their thing. What I didn't like the NFL was just NFL at the time. You had the smaller schools playing against the bigger schools every year, and that's not fair. I think what now is everybody's in their own section, and it's, I think it's a lot better. Because you had Tonawanda playing North Tonawanda, Lockport, and all those big schools. And I, I, at that time, I think, gee, that's not fair to those smaller schools. So, but I think what we got now in this section is great. Everybody's got their own uh, thing. And when I was there at Sweet Home, you know, you could change. You could always move up. 
So uh, we used to move up. We didn't. Sit, we moved. We didn't want to be. We wanted to move up when I was a sweet home because I wanted to play it against the Ken Moores in North Carolina. If we were down, we were going to Lancaster and all those schools down there. So I wanted to move up, play the schools that are around us. So we moved up one division when I was a head coach at Sweet Home. I want to ask you about Dave Anastasi and Eric Jancy. Oh, good guy. They're good coaches. I know them personally and know them as coach. Very good coaches. Yeah. yeah they were good. They were good. I said they, I, I, we had good battles between us. Good guys, good coaches. And they did a, the program was very good. Who were you uh, close when you were coaching? Did you have uh, different coaches at different schools that you were close to? Guys that you saw at clinics and guys you shared information with and, and picked each other's brains? Yeah, I did. I, I coached. This, this, is, this, is, this is really funny, but it's not funny. My coach, my wife tells me, why don't you get all these guys you coach with in football and wrestling and go out? I said, Noreen, I'd like to, but they're all dead. All the guys I coach with, Pete Rail, Gene Zenny, all these guys that I coach with, they're they're all gone. Every kid, every coach that I had in high school with me is gone. The coach with me, older or younger, they're passed away. So that's, but uh, that's the sad part, I think, right there. It's, I had some great coaches with me, and I tell you what, you don't win without good assistant coaches. If you don't have assistant coaches, that if you, they don't know the sport, you got to teach them. I'd be able to, when I took over at Sweet Home, I had guys that never played football, but I taught them the sport and taught them what to do. And they can great, they become good coaches if they've never played the game. But you got to have good assistant coaches to have a good program. And then you got to have athletes too, of course. That's number one. But you still have good assistant coaches, you're not going to win. That's, that's, you know, you got to have a head coach that can teach the coaches, no matter what the position is, offense or defense. So you finished with 200 wins as a, as a football head coach in Western New York, uh, 232 wins uh, as a wrestling coach at, at, at Sweet Home. How do you want to be remembered? I think I'd like to be remembered that I did the job as a, as a coach and I, I, did the, I did the job. I taught the kids and they did the best they could. And I don't know. It just, I guess it's just that way, I guess. I just think, hopefully they taught the kids something good that they can carry on in their life, you know? The things, I think it's important. The kids in sports learn a lot of discipline. They learn a lot of things that you carry on in your life. I see kids that I coached at Sweet Home. The first two years, there's some of them, I see them and they carry on and what they, how they've done in their life is amazing what some of them have done. So I feel great about that. I feel great when a kid that I coach is really successful and doing great in life. And that means I must have taught them something on discipline. Coach, I want to give you the last word. We, we've talked a lot about different subjects here. What would you like to talk about that I haven't brought up? Uh, I don't know, John. I just, I just think playing any kind of, I don't care what the sport is. If you enjoy the sport, play it. But if you want to be good at it, you want to be good at a sport, you got to put extra time in. You can't, like my son, Tom was a wrestling, was a wrestler for me. He just didn't wrestle. He played football, but he wrestled in the season. But after the season, he still went to clinics. He wrestled all year long. And that's why he became good. Same thing in football. If you want to be good in football, you got to do something on the off season. You And if you want to be a coach, you better work with your kids in the summer and teach them stuff. You just can't say, well, I'll show up first day of football practice and the end of the last day of five days and I'm done. It's not coaching. Coaching is you coach 12 months a year. If you want to be good, and same with the players. If they want to be good, they have to put extra time in. I got a granddaughter right now who's is in eighth grade. She plays soccer. She's on two travel teams now because she loves she loves soccer and she's a good athlete. So she's going to be good because she puts she does it 12 months a year. And if you look at any of the program, anybody that's really good, you don't see them just on the football season. They got to be off a great athletes that just play one. I don't care what the sport is. I don't care if it's tennis, golf. You got to put extra time in to be good. And that's all I tell the kids. If you want to be good, I tell my granddaughter, you want to be good, you got to do extra things. If you want to be a football player. You got to get in the weight room. You, like I got a grandson that played. 
You got to get in the weight room. You got to lift weights. You got to work on it in the summer, work on your technique. You can say any sport, golf, tennis, you're only good because you put extra time in. That's all I tell people. If you want to be good in sport, you got to do it all year long. You, that, that doesn't mean you can't do another sport, but spend some time in that sport you love the most. And that's what I tell kids. And I, I love watching all kinds of sports. And I love seeing kids that are successful. The things that they do, and I watch the Olympics, the gymnastics, I am freaking amazed what they do. When they get up on that high bar, they're doing freaking flips and stuff. I go, oh, my. It's just freaking amazing what they do in gymnastics that they didn't do 30 years ago. You imagine how much practice they must have put in to be able to do something like that? It's just amazing me. The gymnastics amaze me. Everything, all the sports and Olympics amaze me what these kids do. You think, man, how did you get that good? It's just crazy what they can do nowadays. So I don't care if it, what it is like. Watching kids and you watch people in golf. I made well, I made Mickelson. I used to watch him a lot. I still remember when he was in his forties. He had a tee shot. I think the that was uh, three hundred and the, I think the hole was three hundred and forty yards. He put it on the green at three hundred and forty yards. I go, oh my god! You know how much practice you have to be to good in golf? It's just you have to do it every day. So anybody that's good in sports does it 12 months a year. That's all I'm saying. I don't care what level it is, what the sport is, and that they have to understand. Okay. So that's all. And that number one thing to me is still safety and discipline to be good in sports. If I was, as a coach, safety, discipline, and teaching technique and being able to adjust to things now. Cause now when I play football, when I was playing and when, when I would start coaching, people use one, two formations. Now they use six or seven. They'll put out trips on offense and you put out two guys to cover trips. Come on, that's not too smart. I've seen that happen. That's just crazy. Coach, I want to thank you so much. This was very enjoyable. It was great to meet you. Thank you so much for the conversation and your insight and reflecting back on your career, coaching career. I wish you well. I wish you good health. Thank you once again. Thank you. I'm glad you had me. Okay, stay healthy. That's the big thing. Stay healthy.